Awesome. You ready, Bryson? Yay. All right, hi. I'm John Atkinson. I'm with Your Whole Baby. And uh, with me, joining me here uh, is Doctors of Opposing Circumcision. I coordinated and uh, supported this event, uh, our, our booth and uh, the speech here. Um, <laughs> I'll be honest, my prepuce was amputated when I was a baby, or you might want to consider it uncircumcised. I don't like that, like that word, but that's the word that most people know. And uh, my wife and I have two boys. One's over there taking video right now. The oldest is almost 14. And uh, and he's he's the reason why I'm here. He's he's the reason that sent me on a trajectory to this point in my life right here. And it was not an easy journey. I, I didn't just jump right into this. I, I figured it out. And plenty of times I was dubious. Uh, I'm also the founder of a, an organization called Genital Autonomy Society because this doesn't just affect boys. If you look at the entire world, it's, it's a non-sexist thing. Girls and intersex are affected as well. Um, but in, I'm not a doctor, so in order to bring some credibility to this, I brought John Peschker from Dr. Supposing Circumcision. And as you've probably read on the, on the thing, he, he's a, he was also featured in the American Circumcision documentary. Please give it up for him. Hi, just a couple words to begin with about Doctors Opposing Circumcision. It was started by George Denniston, and we provide a whole series of benefits. First aid advice for forced retractions, injuries. We support regret parents, those with mixed boys, one circumcised, one not. Uh, we help conscientious objectors who are not, uh, doctors, nurses, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, medical assistants who do not wish to cut the healthy genitals of children. We give restoration advice to men who were circumcised and legal advice to lawyers, etc. And I, I have to give credit to George Denniston, who is my boss and the founder of DOC, who's a former professor, emeritus professor at the University of Washington Medical School. So here are some of the doctors on the board of directors of Doctors Opposing Circumcision. I saw a tiny Facebook rumor that we we're just the invention of some guy in a basement. We are not. We are an international organization with thousands of members. So go to our website, Doctors Opposing Circumcision. There's useful advice there on the subject. Medical, heavily researched, took five, 14 physicians five years to put this together, and with the help of a lot of writers from around the world. So today my presentation is on what's called, what I'm calling the well-tempered organ, which for those of you who are uh, music majors, you'll probably get the joke. Um, and it's on the engineering principles of the natural penis, which is a different approach than I think I've ever taken. And I only have about 20 minutes in which to make the case. Here's a trivia question just for fun. How many of you know the connection between breakfast cereals and American circumcision? If you know, don't, don't tell anybody else because it's kind of fun. The secret is fun and I'll tell you at the end. So, a, 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 an overriding concept is that evolution has designed our bodies to be mostly self-defending and self-cleaning or none of us would be here. I assure you that our primate ancestors of 10,000 years ago weren't scrubbing their boy's penis down at the nearest river. It didn't happen. Here's how the foreskin grows in utero. It starts out as little tiny buds on the end of itself a tiny little bud and then grows and becomes a thin layer until it joins up sometime before birth and completely seals off the interior portion of the penis. That membrane, the lanoprofusial lamina it's called, stays there for about 10 years. And it shouldn't be tampered with, it shouldn't be torn, it shouldn't be troubled, and it's easy to take care of an intact boy. They do absolutely nothing, just entirely leave him alone. As the boy ages, that membrane will start to break down, as you see in the picture, second from the right. And at that point, he might have a little opening that gets some urine in it, so you might have ballooning, he might have a small discharge of, what, of a white substance. This is all normal. Eventually, after age, sometime after age 10, he'll be able to see his glands, and he'll function as an adult male would. So the foreskin is fused to the glands by a protective developmental membrane. 
it's very much like the female hymen. If you think about it in structure, it protects the boy's internal organs during the years when he doesn't need to worry about reproduction, when nature doesn't wouldn't want him to reproduce. It's a layer between two mucosal layers, that membrane, and it's kind of nature's natural slip sheet. In other words, protecting those two surfaces from growing together and providing a, a, layer, a boundary layer of cells that slowly disappears, allowing the two structures to be independent. So the rule, and I often give a longer, much longer class than now on care of the intact boy, uh, but the basic rule is very simple, only clean what you see. Only clean what is seen. The outside of the penis, the exterior skin, is all that needs cleaning, just like a finger or a hand. <clears throat> the inner foreskin and urethra are cleaned by sterile urine. When a boy pees two or three times a day, he's flushing himself out, and that's all the cleaning that's needed. No internal cleaning is needed by an adult, and no soap inside the foreskin even for men. And by the way, adult men who are not circumcised do not need to be cleaning the inside of their penis as much as they think they do. It simply isn't needed. There are natural immune substances, disease-fighting substances inside that are secreted that you wish to retain. Now, I'm gonna jump into my engineering stuff, and here I have to apologize. I'm from New Zealand originally, where we don't circumcise at all, I haven't done for 50 years, and the children, I assure you, are just as healthy as American children. Secondly, I was once a marine engineer. That's a, a, a person who handles engines on a ship, and so I know a little bit about flow dynamics, and I thought I'd apply it to a defense of the human penis, which is actually a marvelous, marvelously designed piece of machinery. So the features we'll be looking at are some of the ones you see on the screen there, the Bourdon tube, which I'll explain, the rolling bearing portion, the choker valve, and I brought one with me, which we can, maybe we could pass it around. I can run up and get the, Yeah, so when you, when we come to the joker valve portion, you know, the joker valve will be making the way around. Also, the interior portion is self-cleaning and it contains a pump, and the glands is relatively insensate and it's basically a mandrel, a shaping device. So here's male anatomy 101. That little tiny pointy part on the end of a newborn boy has a name. It's called the acrohostion. That was its name in ancient times. In Greece and Rome 2,000 years ago, it was a prized possession of any male to have a nicely formed acropostion. Here's one seen on a bronze statue from the first century AD. So unfortunately, the anatomy you're about to learn is foreign to any medical or nursing student. It simply isn't part of our curriculum, and that's a cultural problem. Here's an acropostion on an infant. It's a one-way valve that protects his urethra. It retains immune active substances and retains lubrication. You'll sometimes see infants who are born with a long overhanging foreskin like this, sometimes called a redundant foreskin, and doctors will often urge that that be cut off. However, that's a terrible idea, because as this doctor writing in 1916, a Canadian doctor from nearby Victoria says, what's happened is the body has produced a long foreskin waiting for a long penis. So when the inner structure grows, it'll need that foreskin. So you don't cut it off or he would not have enough coverage on his penis to function in adulthood. So there's no such thing as a redundant foreskin. It's in the eyes of a billing physician. It's not a real thing. Here's the joker valve that I were passing around. It's a mechanical device that allows flow to go in one direction and not to back up. It works like this. Pressure on the left-hand side of the screen there into that bulb opens the lips up of the valve but does not allow fluid to go backwards. The pressure on top of that flat surface and on the bottom of that surface closes the lips and so the fluid can only move in one direction. That's one of the functions of the acroposteon. Now, another thing, the foreskin has cells in it that exude moisture. They're very much like what I would remember from my merchant marine training as a sintered bearing. A sintered bearing has little tiny holes between the molecules of brass into which is injected grease or graphite or oil to make the bearing self-lubricating. Very handy feature, and nature has nicely reproduced it. 
What you see there on the right-hand side of the screen is a foreskin that's been retracted. That black line was at the outer edge of this man's penis before we retracted it for the photograph. It's a remarkably large amount of tissue that is lost due to circumcision. <coughs> Inside are tiny little booster lubrication pumps called Cowpers that produce an extra boost of lubrication fluid during sexual arousal. It's one of the earliest things in sexual arousal, so, and it's retained by the acroplusion. It's retained by the little pucker or one-way valve on the end of the penis in a man who's intact. Obviously, this has to do with babies. But uncircumcised men do not have this advantage. That fluid is typically lost. Here's a Bourdon tube. I told you I'd describe it. A Bourdon tube is, I mean, the principle is nicely illustrated by a party favor, right? You've all seen these where you blow on it and the big uncurls, there's a spring inside. A guy named Eugène Bourdon invented it in Paris in 1849 and won lots of prizes for the invention. He discovered that if you blow on a curled tube, it wants to straighten out. And so that technique is used in pressure gauges of all kinds all over the world. But as I remember from my merchant marine training, which is over 50 years now, I'm, I'm afraid to say, I remember an old crusty engineer saying, gentlemen, there's a part of the human body that responds like a food on tube. And I think you know which one. So it turns out that erections are a form of Bourdon too. But I, I don't have one pictured here because I thought, well, next audience, who knows how people would react to it. Maybe we shouldn't show an erect penis. And so you won't, you'll, I, I suspect some of you have seen one or have one, um, and you know. But consider this interesting fact. All healthy humans, male or female, have at least three what are called nocturnal tumescence events during their sleep all their lives, even before birth. Most, most, 95% of course, are non-sexual. There are even pictures to be seen of boys holding an erect penis before they were born. It's probably a mechanism for making sure that that part of the body has a healthy level of oxygen. That's a theory. So here's a peristaltic pump. A peristaltic pump is one that uses a roller or a device to squeeze uh, a fluid up a, a, tu a tube much the way you would use a uh, more toothpaste out of a toothpaste tube that's running out. So that's a peristaltic pump seen in diagrammatic form. Here's a medical one. And these are commonly used to deliver medicines in measured doses and measured intervals in hospital settings. My wife was an IV nurse. She could tell you all about them. The male reflex, which is triggered by erogenous tissue, is a similar kind of peristaltic pump. What happens is the friction-sensitive sensors on the penis initiate a one-way peristaltic chain reaction, which starts at, in this case, the far left here, and pushes everything by using a narrowing of the muscles to eject things. By the way, I, I, I promised the lady who gave me this that I would plug her organization, which is the Pacific Northwest Surrogacy. And this is, of course, a little tiny foam rubber playful sperm. But they do swim with their little flagellum, the little swimming portion of it, but they need a little help to get going before they swim. Okay. Now we come to the glands. Uh, here, here's an interesting myth for you. Let me take a sip of water. It's interesting. I, I've spent a lot of time studying urology in the basement of the University of Washington Medical Library. And I've run across book after book of urology theurologists claiming that the most sensitive part of a male's penis is his glands. Here's the truth. It has very little in the way of sensation at all. It has a few scattered, what are called protopathic nerve endings, and has almost no erogenous tissue except at the corona. It probably functions, and I'm guessing here, as two things. A shaping and warming device for the foreskin itself, which is the more important part, and a mandrill. The mandrill is a device that's used to shape pipes when pipes are made. This is a mandrill to make a pipe that has a curve in it. And these are various sizes of mandrills for different size pipes. So you can think of the glands as relatively useless, frankly, 
except for its sh shaping purpose and its warming and moistening. <laughs> Here's the important part of the male. It's the ridge band and the frenulum delta. The most sensitive part of a male is right here, radiating out over the top of the penis and back down around the other side in a large loop like this. By the way, just for fun, on the left is a picture of a festival held every year in northern Japan to celebrate the male organ. And behind it, the picture of that man in his costume. I do not know what role he's playing. But behind him is the picture of a penis with its frenulum delta and its um, the frenulum delta are well, well presented. So here's, here's an intact boy in diagrammatic form. His foreskin is inside, it can't be attended to at all, it's completely sealed off, and that's normal. It's developmental, waiting for growth. Circumcision, unfortunately, rips this tissue open and ablates it almost entirely. You'll see in a second. And a couple of interesting points to remember. During your child's growing years, He's going to have some bumps and lumps there, which might look like they're infectious. They're not. They're just aggregates of cells that are shedding from the membrane that's going away. And you might have ballooning, where his urine fills the, the uh, spaces in between. That, too, is healthy. And you might see a white discharge that, once again, is just a, a shedding of skin cells and excess lubrication. <coughs> The, ingen the, ingen the ingenious part, from an engineering perspective, of the human penis is the fact that the foreskin is halfway down the shaft in use. And what you, ask, you might ask yourself, why would evolution produce that? And I have a theory, I'm sure it's hotly contested, but I have a theory that the reason that the glands is insensitive and the reason that the foreskin actually moves down the penis and is more closer to midway is to increase fertility because it increases penetration. We could have a, a long bottle of wine over that issue, but um, I think that's a pretty good theory. Here's the result of circumcision. On the left you see an intact male and you're only seeing the bottom side, you're not seeing the top. He has erogenous tissue over an area about the size of an index card, about three by five. And of course it's wrapped entirely around the penis. It's not just in one place. On the circumcised man, there's no sensation on the top of the penis that's at all erogenous. There's only some sensation near the urethra. This, this is all he's got left, if he has that left. I've actually had men consult me who had a freehand circumcision and a phrenectomy. A phrenectomy, a freehand circumcision follows the curve of the glands, takes out all of this tissue entirely. Those men are functionally impotent. They might work for a while in their 20s based on who knows what nerve reflex, but they're going to be useless in their 50s and 60s. How much is amputated? Well, once again, it's twice the length of the foreskin because it's folded over, right? And it's at least five inches in circumference if you do the math of a normal penis. So that's 15 square inches, 96 square center, or 90 some square centimeters of lost tissue, <coughs> including nerves, glands, muscles, veins, and if you've ever seen an intact man, you notice how richly enervated his penis is, and if you see a circumcised male, you notice he doesn't have any of the hardy big veins that you typically see. So, I want to warn you, those of you who will have an intact boy, and I hope this all of you, against forced retraction. You can retract a boy for that portion of his foreskin pretty much the acroposteon, to look inside and see if his urethra is, is competent and look for signs of infection. But you mustn't, as seen in the last panel, go beyond this point. Going beyond this point tears open the membrane and is a permanent injury. And I have attended over 1,200 boys injured in this fashion by parents who were told to do this, by medical professionals who are ignorant or cruel, and uh, it, it's a horrible injury, which actually has problems for the child later on in life. Here's a California boy that was attract, a, a retracted, forcibly retracted during a six-month-well baby visit. I remember the case. He ended up in the ER and was attended to by a urologist in the middle of the night 
to solve this edema, this massive edema that you see here from the trauma. Here's a New Mexico boy who was also forcibly retracted at a six month well baby visit. And you appreciate the irony, right? You take in a healthy baby, you bring out an injured one. What happened there? How does that work? So I tell people, if you have an intact boy, a dangerous time for you is a well baby visit. And you should be very cautious and tell your practitioner you do not want your child forcibly retracted. So now he might develop a urinary tract infection and they might want a urine sample. Using a urinary catheter is not the best method. It is a method and it's a common method, but it's not the best method. For one thing, it pushes bacteria inward. But a lot of medical practitioners will say, well, we have to forcibly retract your boy because we need to do that to clean him, to put in a catheter. But it can be done without fully retracting the boy and should be done because why would you tear open sterile tissue to try and sterilize an area that was sterile before you tore it? So I have an article for you on how that can be done and also a video if your child is facing retraction. All you have to do is ask me for it. It's free. We also have artwork at DOC that we can give you uh, that you can take to FedEx Kinko's and make yourself diaper stickers. I also have a colleague with me here from Your Whole Baby. They have a whole packet of materials they will send you to caution your medical practitioner against forcibly retracting your boy. And I believe you have stickers as well, do you not, John? Yes. So here's the answer to the trivia quiz. Did anybody, know, did anybody guess it before I show you the answer? All right. The answer is that in the 19th century, people believed that cereal prevented excess sexual desire. And so John Harvey Kellogg, whose brother started Kellogg's Corn Flakes, promoted Corn Flakes as a way to calm you down so you would not be quite as randy. <laughs> CW Post, Post Toasties, right? CW Post, Post Toasties also invented his cereal as a way to control unusual and fearful sexual desire. Next to him is Reverend Sylvester Graham, who was on the moral side of the issue and promoted brain crackers for controlling sexual desire. So if you find yourself at home tonight feeling unnecessarily randy, I suggest reaching for some grain crackers. <laughs> All right, let me commend you to the film. Nobody, lots of people have sent me fan letters. I haven't had any selfies with audience members yet. But I urge you to watch American Circumcision. It's available on iTunes, Amazon, Vimeo, Netflix, and of course, as a hard copy from Amazon. At Doc, we have brochures you might find useful. Warning brochures about forced retraction. Um, an article about catheterizing without retraction. And my all-time favorite brochure, uh, Foreskin Care, the Wee Willie brochure, has a little penis with his foreskin closed off with a blue bow. I think it's a wonderful little graphic. And that's available for free as well. So that's the end of, that's the end of my session, and I'm happy to answer any questions from the audience. How are they doing timing? Oh, minutes. three minutes left over, unbelievable. Was that all clear? Well, I actually have a favor to ask of you. This is the first time I've ever done the engineering of the human penis as seen by, through the eyes of uh, someone trained as a marine engineer back in my post-university days. And I wonder whether it's persuasive. I mean, I'm persuaded personally that the human organ, as produced by nature, is a marvelous device whose, whose actual minor little details are unappreciated, especially in Anglophone culture but I'd be interested to know whether you find it persuasive. Well, there's one persuaded person, two, three, four, five. Well, that's pretty good. I have to tell you, my wife told me, she's, I showed her the program and she said, geez, John, you're kind of mansplaining. <laughs> you, know, you know mansplaining, right? That's men explaining things with excessive detail to unwilling women who wish they were somewhere else. <laughs> so. She's worried that it would be a mansplaining event, which is probably why she's not here. So, any, any questions? Wow, I can't believe I was that clear. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it.